everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10, Taxidermy Hats. At the turn of the century, the most fabulous people in society adopted one of the strangest fashions in history. They began wearing taxidermied animals on their heads. You know, like a dead stuffed fox or a mink on your head. Victorian people loved their hats. There was nothing that grabbed someone's attention or alerted strangers of your social status quite like an impressive hat. Nobody seems to know exactly how it started or who the first person to pull it off was. But we know taxidermy hats lasted all the way through the Victorian era and even into the 1920s. In 1883, for example, Miss Kate Fearing Strong attended the Vanderbilt Ball in New York wearing a taxidermy kitten as her hat. Not even the whole kitten, but just the top half above the shoulders. Imagine if someone tried to do that now. There would be an angry mob after them. That fashion is completely dead. But in the Victorian days, this craze was unstoppable. People wore all varieties of dead animals on their heads and called it fashion. Birds, bats, squirrels, and even entire chickens. High society folk would literally walk around with dead chickens perched on top of their heads. What animal would you wear on your head if you lived back then? Let me know in the comments below. Number 9. Fortune Telling If you think crystals, palm reading, and tarot cards are popular now, you should have been around for the 19th century. Fortune telling in the Victorian era was one of the most popular activities around. Divination games were featured at almost every party. Professional practitioners of occult magic read the fortunes of posh gentlemen and their wives, and everyone wanted to talk to the dead. In some of the most prestigious drawing rooms in the English capital, masters of the dark arts were reading palms and predicting fates. Everyone from the top scientists to the lowliest carpenters believed, at least a little bit, in things like divination. We can chalk this obsession up to the incredible improvement of human life in the 19th century. Things were looking much better for people in general than they had been at any time before. Not everyone was rich, but more people had money and society was more or less stable. And so people needed entertainment. They couldn't sit down and watch TV, but they could see an old woman about their future. Not everyone appreciated the hocus pocus of it and not everyone played by the rules. There were fraudsters, thieves, and people who were frequently imprisoned for lying about prophecies. In the year 1807, a man named Joseph Powell was convicted of fortune telling, denounced as a vagabond, and was locked up in prison. He was caught defrauding people out of their very last shillings with promises of secret mystic wisdom. He was also busted taking advantage of women who went to him out of desperation. Women wanted to know if Joseph could look into the future and see if they would ever have children. Instead, he tricked them into his own bed. Number 8. Freak Shows Victorian Britain was the birthplace of something absolutely horrifying. In the early 1880s, a young girl named Crow was taken from her home in the Asian country of Laos brought to London by a man named William Leonard Hunt and put into a freak show. The girl was covered almost completely in thick, dark hair, with some saying she had double-jointed knuckles and pouches in her cheeks like a chipmunk. This young girl was exhibited at the London Aquarium as if she were a rare breed of fish, and she wasn't the only one. Even just the term freak show today is considered offensive, but in the 19th century, these types of places were everywhere. You could find them at fairs, inside shops, tucked away in music halls, anywhere with a lot of people, villains like William Hunt would set up their exhibitions. But the really awful thing is that the Victorian Londoners loved it. Anyone who looked unusual, people with really dark skin, those with visible deformities, the disabled, they could all be put in a freak show. And they were always profitable because people paid to see them. They were basically human zoos. The young Laotian girl was advertised as the missing link between monkeys and man. And Joseph Merrick, who you may know as the Elephant Man, was even put on display at a small sideshow in Whitechapel. The freak show did eventually fall out of favor. By 1847, such exhibitions were being mocked as public opinion started to change. Those who sought out deformities were considered lower-class people, 
and this helped to eventually push the freak show underground and then erase it forever. Number 7. Grave Robbing One of the most lucrative professions in Victorian times was grave robbing. There were medical schools all throughout the country in the 19th century trying to make advancements in modern medicine, but they were short of bodies. Doctors and medical students needed bodies to become great surgeons and to come up with new treatments. The only way they could get the necessary number of bodies was by turning to men who didn't mind digging and stealing them right out of the ground. Thanks to the first common carrier railroad in 1828, these body snatchers could dig a grave, put a body in a box, and ship it to a medical school for quick payment. By far, the most notorious city in America for grave robbing was Baltimore. For over 70 years, Baltimore was the center of resurrections. There were half a dozen medical schools in the city alone, and they all needed bodies. Plus, Maryland had ideal weather for digging up corpses all year round. Perhaps the most bizarre part of the whole thing is that a lot of the time, the grave robbers were the doctors themselves. Schools would send doctors, janitors, and even students out to rob fresh graves when they were in desperate need of bodies to experiment on. I mean, I guess how else were they supposed to get bodies? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already for more strange history. Number 6. Ghost Photography In the 19th century, when cameras became available to the public, photography was a pretty big deal. And what was one of the first things Victorian people did with their new cameras? They started taking pictures of ghosts. Ghost photography became huge in Victorian England and America, and just like fortune telling, it drew a crowd of shifty charlatans and clever liars. Looking back from today, it's easy to see why people believed in this kind of thing. The spiritualism movement was enormous, and people hadn't really seen photographs before. Everyone assumed that if you took a picture with a camera, whatever was in that picture was in fact real. But where spirit photography really took off was in the United States. Right after the Civil War, over 620,000 lives were lost during the fighting, with many people left sad, missing their loved ones, and desperate for closure. When spirit photography showed up in the 1860s, people could pay a small sum to have a picture taken with their dead loved ones. A medium would conjure the spirit, and a photographer would snap the shot. But the photographers were usually chemists, and they could mess with the pictures. They would manipulate them in such a way to trick poor, sad people into thinking their deceased relatives were hanging around, waiting to be photographed. One of these ghost photographers was a man named William Mumler. He worked out of Boston and became so successful that people would line up outside his portrait studio and pay up to $10 each for spirit pictures. But he became too famous, too successful, and was eventually brought down as a fraudster. Number 5. Home Children Orphan children were a very big problem in the 19th century in England. Perhaps you've seen the old movies with the gangs of kids running around the streets selling newspapers and pickpocketing. Well, that's a fairly accurate representation. There were hundreds of thousands of children who had no homes and were just kind of wandering around. In 1869, Annie McPherson decided to solve the problem. She came up with a scheme that would ultimately see over 100,000 children shipped from England to the colonies, places like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa. It was a way to get rid of orphan kids cluttering London's busy streets while also shipping English citizens to the colonies. All these places would eventually grow up and be their own countries, but at the time it seemed like a perfectly reasonable solution. Basically, orphans would be picked off the street, put on a boat, and shipped wherever. But when they got there, they weren't just released to run around in the wild. They were almost always forced into hard labor. Annie McPherson, who was appalled when she learned of the child slavery going on in the industries in England, wanted to do better for those kids. But instead, she became one of the biggest slave traders of children in history. Even though many might have gone on to live better lives, most just ended up working on farms and in factories in other places. The children became known as home children, and the emigration program lasted officially until the 1930s. However, it wasn't entirely terminated until the 1970s. 
Number 4. The Glutton Club When we think of Charles Darwin today, we think of a scientist who came up with some of the most important ideas regarding evolution. But what a lot of people don't know is that Charles Darwin was part of a very weird 19th century club. The club was occupied by students who were bloodthirsty monsters. Not really, but kind of. It was called the Glutton Club, housed at Cambridge University. The members of the club were devoted to eating both birds and beasts which had never before graced the human plate. They ate things like hawk, heron, brown owl, puma, iguana, and armadillo. Charles Darwin himself even ate a giant tortoise. He even tried to drink the reptile's bladder contents. In the 1800s, no animal was safe from Charles Darwin. He was a great scientist, but also didn't think twice about scarfing down any creature he could find. There was one instance in which he accidentally ate a bird called a lesser rhea, something kind of like an ostrich. This was after he had spent months trying to catch it. He wasn't trying to catch it to eat it, but to describe it scientifically. Once Darwin realized he was eating the very bird he had set out to document, he packaged up the leftover bones, skin, and feathers and sent them back to England. How about you? Are you an adventurous eater? Let me know in the comments below. Number 3. Speaking with the Dead Just like divination and ghost photography, Victorian people became obsessed with seances. For those who don't know, a seance is when a medium, a person who can interact with the spirit world, conjures up a ghost with the help of that ghost's family and friends. You've probably seen a seance in a movie before, with all the people holding hands and sitting around a table while a ghost appears above them. In the 1850s, mediums were some of the biggest celebrities in England. Great parties were hosted in which mediums would communicate with spirits through knockings and rappings on the table. Sometimes the table would even levitate, although this was normally done with concealed wires. In 1855, Daniel Dunglas Holm became one of the top mediums in the country, with his specialty being levitation. It was said he could rise into the air and float horizontally out one window and float in through another. But his act fell apart in 1868 when he convinced an elderly widow to adopt him as her legal son. He stole her fortune and was busted as a fraud. Daniel was taken to court and his reputation was tarnished. But by this time, speaking with the dead had really taken off. Seances were happening all over America and Europe, but more importantly, scientists had taken a serious interest in it. They were skeptical at first, but soon decided seances and other spiritual activities were part of a new branch of scientific research. This phenomenon led to scientific investigations into the paranormal. In short, the Victorian era was a time of great revelation, intrigue, and eager belief. It wasn't that Victorian people were gullible, it was that they had never heard heard or seen anything like it before, and had no real reason not to believe it. This is how seances spread like wildfire, and speaking with the dead became an acceptable thing to do. Number 2. Creepy Christmas Cards Christmas cards in the 19th century were not like the Christmas cards you and I are used to. They were dark, twisted, and quite frankly disturbing. During the holiday season in Victorian times, people would give each other greeting cards with things like bloodthirsty snowmen on them, dead birds, and other bizarre images. One greeting card from the 1800s read, May yours be a joyful Christmas. The illustration was of a dead robin. Another card had an illustration of an elderly couple laughing hysterically as they dumped water on a group of carolers from a second floor window. The thing about the Victorian times is that there was a really weird moral code which had people bound up tightly in the rules of social conduct. But at the same time, they also had no qualms about posing with dead people for photographs, robbing graves, literally selling their bodies, or sending holiday cards with pictures of killer clowns and devils. Number 1. Obsessed with Arsenic Victorian people had a really strange obsession with brightly colored wallpaper. This is one of the weirder trends that swept across England in the 1800s, kind of like the taxidermy hats. But what the Victorians didn't know at the time was that all their bizarre wallpaper contained arsenic, and a lot of people got poisoned. In fact, arsenic was everywhere in the Victorian era. It was in the material used to make baby carriages, it was in food coloring, and it was plastered in bright green flamboyant patterns on people's bedroom walls. According to historian Lucinda Hoxley, 
The problem can be traced back to the color green. A Swedish chemist by the name of Carl Scheele used copper arsenite to create the brightest and most brilliant green color the English had ever seen. It became wildly popular with everyone in the middle class and up. You couldn't walk into somebody's home without being hit in the face by fluorescent green wallpaper. Today, it's pretty rare to see any decoration in green. Nowadays, people don't want green floors or walls, and if you think about it, you hardly see anyone wearing green clothing. But the Victorians loved it. It took a very long time for them to realize their green wallpaper was causing the mysterious illnesses that was killing their children. A book called The Yellow Wallpaper, published in 1892, describes how one woman gradually went completely insane after one of the rooms in her house was covered in new wallpaper. And that was happening in real time to people all over the country. Death and madness continued until around 1885, when colors containing arsenic stopped being used in popular designs. Thanks for watching! What do you think is the craziest thing the Victorians did? Let me know in the comments below! And remember to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!